Hej. Nina from Melbourne Instruments is a 12-voice, multi-tambral, hybrid wavetable and subtractive synth. that uses 32 drone motors to solve one of the most frustrating aspects of synths, that once you swap a preset or timbre, the physical knob positions become irrelevant, forcing you to look for values on a screen, accept sudden value changes, or have to turn a knob back and forth until its physical position matches up with the preset value. It also uses those motors to perform a couple other nifty tricks, like show modulation depth, morph values, and create different detents based on the knob mode. In this video, I'll take a look at all those things and the synth aspects of Nina, of course, including pros and cons compared to competing synths. start a quick disclosure, I got Nina directly from the company and it cost me substantially less than retail, however they have no say over the content of this video and don't get to see it before it's published. This channel is funded mainly by viewers who subscribe to exclusive content and book updates on Patreon, including several multi-sampled sounds from the synth, YouTube premium and ads, and price check affiliate links in the description which help the channel regardless of the product you choose to buy. Okay, I don't think I ever started an overview of a synth talking about its knobs, but they're probably the most unique thing about this synth for a few reasons. The most obvious use for motorized knobs is to change knob values between presets. So if I load up a different preset, then all the knobs will move to adapt to the parameter values of that patch. This doesn't just apply when you load up new patches. If I load up a multi-tambral or multi-layer patch, this is layer one on MIDI channel one. MIDI channel two is layer two, this one. Layer three on MIDI channel three. And layer four on MIDI channel four. So this, in my opinion, is huge. If you've ever used a multi-tambral synth, you'll know how frustrating it is to have the panel become totally irrelevant as you change layers. The next and very interesting use for the motorized knobs is the mod matrix. If you enter mod matrix mode, you'll be able to see how each of the sources labeled here on the bottom affects or doesn't every one of the destinations on the panel. So for example, the keyboard affects tuning and the LFO in this case impacts the filter cutoff, so I can reduce it to zero, and the envelope, and have it impact the envelope level, the filter cutoff, or both, or any other parameter, say, oscillator three position. Mod depths, by the way, are bipolar, so over here, there's no mod depth. This positive, and this is negative. The next reason Nina's motorized knobs are useful are for its morph function, which I'll explain in depth later, but basically each preset contains two sounds, A and B. So in this case, this is sound B, and this is sound A, and you can morph between them. As you can see, the knob positions will change as you do so. The knobs, by the way, are very high resolution. Anyway, the next thing they can do, which is pretty magical, is create detents for you. So for example, tuning here is smooth as I move it up and down. But if I switch into coarse tuning mode, then hopefully you'll be able to feel this on camera. I jump between the octaves like this. So there are these detents I sort of can't push between this point. Uh, unless I really try hard, then moving back into fine tuning, the detents are gone. Position is saved, of course, so if this is my fine tune, this is my coarse tune, then it will remember the position. All the knobs, by the way, are endless encoders. It's just that the motors apply resistance when you 
reach the edge of where they want you to reach. Same goes, by the way, for when a knob is in bipolar mode. So if I say go into the mod matrix, everything becomes bipolar and there's a little detent you can feel here to quickly reach zero. So those are the knobs. Let's take a look at the synth engine. Again, overview first, and then we'll dive in deeper. Nina has 12 voices. It's a four part multi timbral synth. Like I showed you earlier, you've got up to four layers and you can split the voices between those layers any way you want. Each voice has three oscillators to VCOs, analog, simple, morphable shapes with a sub oscillator option for oscillator one and sync for oscillator two. And then there's a third digital wavetable oscillator. These three oscillators are fed into a mixer along with a fourth either noise source or XOR ring mod or an audio input from the back. The output of the mixer is sent to an analog drive circuit, then into a four pole 24 dB per octave low pass filter. Audio is then sent out to two stereo VCAs with a panning option and a spin feature, which we'll talk about later as well. And you can mix in a digital effects circuit, which can be one of three effects, a chorus, delay, or reverb. In terms of modulation, you've got two ADSR envelopes, two LFOs, and other sources as labeled here in inverse text on the bottom of the panel. On top of that, Nina has a basic arpeggiator and simple 16-step polyphonic sequencer without any parameter motion sequencing. In terms of overall workflow, it's mostly a hands-on experience, but here and there, there are several preset and global parameters that you can only access using the screen and data encoder. So for example, for the LFOs, shape and LFO choice, as well as rate and level, get their own controls, but uh, slew, retrigger, and tempo sync are menu only items. If you want to edit a parameter, you either hit edit and then change it or hold edit and change it like that. And then it bounces back up. These soft buttons under the screen do whatever is labeled on the bottom of the screen. The 16 mechanical buttons on the bottom also have a few functions. You can use them to quickly load different patches in a bank. Each bank can store up to 127 patches and you can store up to 127 banks on this. Anyway, I already showed you earlier, you can use these to select a mod source in mod matrix mode and you can use them in keyboard mode to play an octave in a bit if you don't have a keyboard connected. And they're also useful when you're step sequencing with the uh, 16 step sequencer. To round out the overview, let's talk about build and connectivity. Everything about Nina feels very well built. The screen is OLED, so it has great viewing angles. The mechanical keys aren't velocity sensitive, but they feel very solid. There's no wobble in the knobs, so everything feels very reliable. It's pretty hefty at five and a half kilos or around 12 pounds, and it does get pretty warm. In terms of connectivity, Nina has a quarter inch headphone output and four balanced outputs. Two main outputs include the stereo effects and all four outputs are assignable to each of the four timbres, either in mono per timbre or in stereo pairs. Then Nina has four inputs with the XLR input also good for mic level signals. Then it's got five pin MIDI in, out and through, as well as USB MIDI, both USB-C, a device port for connecting to a computer and two USB-A host jacks for USB drives and MIDI controllers. Nina comes with an external power brick and needs quite a bit of juice, presumably to power the 32 motors, eight amps in total. Okay, let's dive in a little bit deeper and start with preset morph. Just to explain exactly how this works, it's not a vector synthesis style crossfade, rather, let's maybe start with an init patch. So a simple sawtooth. If this is sound A, let's turn up oscillator two and go into sound B and turn up oscillator two here and maybe tune this up and tune this down. So this is B, this is A. So as I morph between them, you can hear the gradual pitch change as opposed to a crossfade from one pitch to the other. This also applies to mod matrix values. So let's, uh, for example, turn down cutoff for both A and B. So they're more or less the same. If I head into the mod matrix, choose the LFO then say, point that to cutoff and to resonance. So now as I morph from A to B, the mod depth will gradually decline along with all the other changes, of course. Just 
just for kicks, I can increase the rate in between A and B. Pretty cool effect, certainly not a crossfade. You can also, with some limitations, load up different presets into A and B and morph between them. So let's, for example, go maybe for this one and load it into B. So now it morphs from this to what we programmed before. So maybe load something else into B. Notice some changes are abrupt, like octave changes. Let's maybe try a crazy one. Go for this one. So. <laughs> That's this preset. And. That's what we created together. Morph does have a few limitations though. While you can control it with external MIDI CCs, it's not available as a modulation destination in the matrix, unfortunately, say, unlike the polybrute from Arturia. And not all the parameters can morph. For example, the sub oscillator and noise generator simply switch types at the halfway point and the overdrive and effects settings need to be the same across sounds A and B. Same goes for the arpeggiator and sequencer settings. One thing I hope they'll change in a future firmware update, you can't save the morph spot as part of the patch. You need to save it either when it's at sound A or sound B. So that's morph. Let's take a look at layers or the multi-timbral aspect of Nina. Layers can be loaded and saved in one of 127, I think different slots. And unfortunately, currently it doesn't save the individual presets in each layer with one press of a button, you need to save them individually. But layers do auto-load pointers to different patches on a per layer basis. So for example, if I load up this multi-timbral set, so one multi-timbral use of Nina could be to use it as a drum synth. This is our kick. And uh, some you'd say, hi-hats, and we can edit that layer. And uh, there's another layer here. That's this patch. And I've also got a bass line going on here. Another, I've got Noodler here. Load up a different set of layers. Got this pattern in one layer, and then a uh, bass on another layer, and pads on another. And I can just control them through here. and control the individual layers. Unfortunately, there's clicking as you go from layer to layer. A bit. Hopefully they find a way to fix this. But um, yeah, nice way to control multiple tempers, sequence them externally. In this case, from Noodler to Nina. The top of the screen will show you which layer you're editing and which preset you've loaded into it. So as you swap current layers, you'll see everything change appropriately. Like I mentioned, you need to determine the number of voices per layer. Output routing, this layer, for example, is sent out to all four outputs, but you can choose any one of a number of options. If you want to create splits, you can choose a low note and a high note then separate MIDI channels if you want to trigger the layers separately. You've got overall volume control per layer, and you can choose which one of the four CV sources you want to send to the mod matrix. The layer menu also has a few other preset settings, which we'll talk about later. 
a few limitations of players. Like I mentioned, you need to allocate voices, so you can't allocate voices dynamically between the four timbres or four layers. Layer one has a few privileges, only it determines the arpeggiator sequencer and the main master effect slot. There's also only one global effect control, so you can't, say, have a global reverb on and have different sends for the different layers. And at least as of now, the internal keyboard only sends notes on channel one, so any other layers that listen to other channels won't play. Sounds to me like something they can and should fix in a firmware update. Okay, let's dive deeper into the synth engine and start with the oscillators. Like I mentioned, there are three of them, two VCOs. The VCOs are pretty simple. They've got a blend between either sawtooth or triangle, which itself morphs between those two shapes, and a square wave with variable pulse width. And you can modulate this through the mod matrix. Like I mentioned earlier, you've got fine tune and coarse tune for both, two octaves each. So up until now, oscillators one and two are identical. And then oscillator one has a special feature. It's sub oscillator. So by default, it plays both shapes on the same octave. But if you press sub, then the square shape will go down an octave. And then oscillator two has oscillator sync. And of course you can modulate pitch with any source in the matrix. Then the third oscillator is a digital wavetable oscillator. The shape button lets you quickly choose one of quite a few factory wavetables. Including a few quote unquote vintage aliased ones. You can choose to have interpolation on or off. If you have it off, then for some wavetables, it'll be audible, for some it won't. So these are pretty smooth, but uh, let's see. I know that this one isn't. Interpolation, by the way, I think is really cool here. Let's turn it on. I don't know, it kind of sounds aggressive to me in a good way. You can load up your own wavetables into here. So for example, I loaded this one that I created in Vital. Hello, Lupa. And this should work well with Serum or any other 2048 sample wavetable files up to 256 frames per wavetable, which I think is pretty impressive. So this is a great way to get interesting timbres. Unfortunately, you can't sample wavetables directly from the inputs, which would have been nice. Hopefully they add that in a future firmware update. So that's the wavetable oscillator. And then there's a noise source, which actually does four different things. Gives you white noise. And oh, pink noise. You can bring in audio from the external input and XOR is a ring mod between the square wave shapes of oscillators one and two. So oscillator levels are set to zero. We're just hearing their ring mod result. And this can be either aggressive or less if the oscillators are in tune, if sync is on or, or not. So a nice way to get harsh or chiptune style tones. Let's move on down the signal path. We've got drive with overdrive into the filter. And then the filter itself is a four pole 24 dB per octave resonant low pass filter, ladder filter. When you crank up resonance, then uh, bass levels 
will go down. Residents will self-oscillate. And it tracks the keyboard more or less across an octave or so, but not precisely. So the filter, I think, sounds very nice and can get crunchy. And resonance will be impacted if you drive it. So par for the course for ladder filters, and in case you were wondering, it can make 303 style sounds. And you do have a dedicated knob for envelope depth, including velocity sensitivity you want. So that's the filter. Let's move on to the VCAs. You've got stereo VCAs right after the filter. There are two ways you can use them to pan sounds around. The first is the spin function. Which is kind of like an LFO that modulates VCA levels. These are through zero VCAs or attenuverters meaning that if you push them far enough, they'll invert the phase of the sound. And then even if you don't spin the sound around, if we go into the layer menu, you've got a couple of panning options here. So the first is panner mode. Ping pong will just alternate left and right for every subsequent voice. And spread is pretty cool. It will spread as many voices as you designate here across the stereo field. And you can spin those around so they work alongside spin as well. In the manual, the company calls this stereo infinite panning as if the sounds were coming from behind you. Personally, I don't hear spin that way. It just sounds like stereo panning. It does make pretty cool chorus-like sounds though, I think. You should be aware though, that the mono sum of this stereo image can cause anywhere from a tremolo-like effect to cancellation of the signal, depending on the spread and location of the source. If you're worried about phase cancellation, just don't use spin and remember not to push panning beyond hundred in the mod matrix. Moving on down the signal chain, you've got the effects. They've only got one on panel control, which is the level of the effect. There's only one slot currently, and you can choose between a chorus, a delay, and a reverb. Let's start with the chorus. I think it's pretty subtle here. So here it's off. This is with chorus. Off. And mixed in, and there are a few chorus modes. Those are all the controls you get for chorus. Then you've got a delay. Quite a few parameters. It can be tempo synced or not. And uh, there's feedback control. 100 goes above 100. So watch out for that. And there's tone control. So that is pretty much the delay. And then there's reverb. You've got a few presets. And again, to access the reverb's parameters, you need to touch the knob. And there's uh, decay. So. Can get nice and long. And there's pre-delay, early mix control, tone, and even shimmer, which is cool. Just one shimmer direction. But uh, definitely nice to have. 
And like I mentioned earlier, again, at least currently, there's only one effect slot. You need to choose one of either chorus delay and reverb, and you only get one effect for all four timbres. Okay, so that's the signal path. Let's talk about modulation. We covered most of this stuff earlier. Aside from a few on panel controls, the magic happens in the mod matrix. You can send the envelope generators anywhere. The two LFOs, LFO one and two, some things like the main level and morph, like I mentioned earlier, aren't available as destinations, but most of the panel controls are. Let's get some modulation going, say, filter cut off. So the envelopes are pretty straightforward. They're simple ADSR envelopes. The LFOs also have the usual suspect shapes. And a few features in the menu, like I mentioned earlier, for example, slew. Smoothen them out. And then tempo sync and re-trigger for every key press. Currently, you can't set the LFOs to modulate each other's rate, but uh, hopefully it'll add that. I'll disable the LFO to the filter and show you wave. This is an audio rate mod from the wavetable oscillator. So say, let's point this to the filter cutoff. So nice way to get uh, interesting gnarly sounds at audio rates. I mentioned earlier, you can disconnect the keyboard from any of the three oscillators and have them drone at a fixed frequency. Velocity and aftertouch are mod sources as is the mod wheel, expression pedal. This is CC11 and MIDI is CC2. I don't think you can configure these. Pan is an interesting one. That is the pan position based on the uh, pan modulation in the layer menu. So you'll get different values based on the combination of the panner mode and panner voices. Then time is a single attack envelope which you can point, say, for example, to wavetable position to modulate that linearly. One thing that's a bit awkward about the time attack envelope is that you set the time in the layer menu. So it's all the way down here. And it would be nice if uh, instead of just values from zero to 100, they'd put milliseconds here. So you'd know how fast you scan through the wavetable position or any other parameter you want to modulate with time. CV and B are one of the four sources you allocate to the layer in the layer menu and set is a static offset you can apply to any one of the mod destinations. It's pretty cool that you can see all the destinations on the panel itself, but um, if you like, you've also got a list of them here on the menu. And if you want to reset a value, there's a detent you can easily reach or just hit the reset soft button. The LFOs, by the way, are per voice. So, you can have them do their own thing for each voice. One important thing that is missing from the mod matrix, at least as of the current firmware, of course, is you can't modulate the mod depth of a, a node in the matrix using one of the other sources. So, say if you wanted to modulate the depth of how much the wave oscillator modulates the filter cutoff, you can't control this with an envelope or with velocity or aftertouch or any other source. That said, you can control the envelope levels. That's the inverse text here. They apply in the mod matrix and the LFO levels. These are all global. So these as destinations are sort of like master controls for the LFOs and the envelopes. And you can control these with any source in the matrix. Let's move on, talk a bit about the arpeggiator and sequencer. The arpeggiator, like I mentioned, is pretty simple. You've got a hold function, if you like and then basically just directions. That's pretty much it. There's no swing, uh, there's no gate length, which would have been nice if it had that. You do have relative clock rate control though. Then the sequencer is also pretty simple. You can't sequence live into it, you just hit record and use either the internal keyboard or an external keyboard to program in notes. So say, for example, program in that sequence. Pretty straightforward. You can also record polyphonic steps. 
and also record uh, rests by hitting the button and ties by hitting where you wanna tie a note to. And that's pretty much the sequencer. You can, however, transpose the sequencer. So that's pretty much it. There's no live recording, no parameter automation, uh, no swing or gate lengths. Hopefully they add that in a future firmware update. Let's load up an init preset, talk about a few more layer parameters or preset parameters that are in the layer menu. There's a unison option. So if we go to poly mode and hit mono, we can increase the number of voices. Let's go up to 12, why not? And unison detune. So that can be taken to an extreme and panning and spread work here as well. There's glide. Though no legato portamento, I asked them about that and they mentioned they're gonna add it. Let's take a quick look at the system menu You've got a few global settings, bit clock, echo filters, which is useful if you're connected to a computer, and a few uh, CV controls for each of the inputs, including input ranges, bank preset management, you can load and save banks, and uh, wavetable management. You can import, I think, uh, up to 128 wavetables, which is pretty nice. Okay, let's talk about pros and cons for Nina. It might seem a bit odd to start a discussion about a musical instrument by talking about its motorized knobs, but I think that when one considers buying a hardware synth as opposed to just getting a plug-in, the interface plays an important part, not just how it sounds. Obviously, cost is certainly a factor, but setting that aside, and I'll talk about alternatives in this price range in a bit, I think that motorized knobs in general, and specifically how they're used here, both when you load up presets in the knob per function mod matrix, and with the morph function, I think cause Nina to fit very nicely into the game changer category, as opposed to these just being a neat parlor trick. I think all of these bring a lot of substance to the way Nina innovates. Using Nina with these is truly a refreshing experience. You don't need to look at a screen to see ADSR values. They're just here on the panel. You can figure out what's going on in a preset very easily, both on the panel itself and in its mod matrix, just by quickly paging through the different sources, and Morph, I think, is a very important sound design and performance tool. Nina also shines on the connectivity front with four separate assignable outputs and four control inputs, and even if the knobs weren't motorized, I think Morph is a very important sound design feature regardless, like it is on Polybrute. That said, knobs and I.O. aside, synth engine features matter too. In that respect, Nina's analog oscillators, analog filter, wavetable oscillators, and 12-voice multi-timbrality put up a very good fight, but there are very fierce competitors in this price range and less expensive ones. Whether it's the all-digital Iridium from Waldorf with many more synthesis engines, filters, and effects, the hybrid 16-voice third wave from Groove Synthesis with three wavetable oscillators, more filters, and multi-tembral effects with more effects options, the Poly Brute from Arturia, which while it doesn't have a wavetable oscillator, has Morph, a better selection of filters, extended effects, and also a fairly clear mod matrix that invites you to patch and play like this does. By the way, sonic capabilities aside, there are other approaches to solve the problem of knobs not showing parameter values, whether it's LED ring encoders like on Hydrosynth or just a very large screen like the ones on Machine, MPC, and Iridium. Other cons, I mentioned these throughout the video. Nina only has one effects slot for all four timbres and a relatively limited set of effects to choose from, at least as of this firmware. The company mentioned that the digital brain behind Nina is a Raspberry Pi 4, so potentially that can be 
expanded, and they mentioned they might open source Nina's code, which could be interesting, though at Nina's price point, it remains to be seen how many developers it will attract. Other cons, you can't modulate or control the depth of a mod slot in the mod matrix, at least as of the current firmware. There's only one filter type, a low-pass filter, with so many layers it would have been nice if you had a few different filter types to spread layers across the spectrum. It would be nice if you could modulate morph, and since there's such a nice high-res screen here, it would be great if it would be used for showing the wavetable shapes, showing animations of mod sources like the envelopes or LFOs. And it would also be nice if they showed you modulation happening in real time, either on the knobs themselves or on the screen. Then finally, something I think would make Nina even more competitive is if you could just easily sample wavetables using one of the inputs in the back. So that's it for Nina. I'll put up multi-samples of my favorite sounds on my Patreon so you can get a taste for playing Nina on your computer or hardware sampler. Stay tuned for quite a few patch demos. And if you like the insights in this video, there are plenty more in my ever-expanding book of electronic music ideas, tips, and tricks available to the people who support this channel on Patreon. Hit like if this was useful. Ring the YouTube bell below if you want to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks for watching.